So Alex, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm from A10 Lab out of Virginia, and I'm gonna give a pretty quick talk today about uh, a spinner model for cascading two port microwave networks. So this is a paper contents. So I'm really just gonna get to touch on a couple of points, uh, mainly the context of why I'm doing this and to give you an application. And the rest of the paper uh, is actually pretty trivial from a geometric algebra perspective. Okay, so context and motivation, what's a microwave network? So microwaves are kind of loosely defined as the section of the electromagnetic spectrum between radio waves and light. So this is what a microwave circuit typically looks like, one manifestation of one. And at these frequencies, wave mechanics becomes more important than capacitors and inductors and voltages and current. So we use a formalism uh, mostly called scattering parameters, and it's also used in quantum mechanics and some acoustic applications. And it's a complex uh, linear algebra based model. So just to give you some examples of some microwave two port circuits, here's a pair of antennas in an antenna chamber. Here's a waveguide twist at, I don't know, 70 gigahertz or something. And as the frequencies get higher, the circuits get smaller. So here's a circuit fabricated at the University of Virginia and they use photolithographic methods at really high frequencies. And then how do you measure something like that? Well, they have these really sophisticated probes that very delicately land on the chips that they manufacture these, these uh, circuits on. And they have that infrastructure working up to about a terahertz, which is kind of amazing. Okay, so scattering parameters, that's the formalism we use. What's good about these uh, are that they're physically meaningful. So the elements of this scattering matrix relate the incident waves, which are the A's, which are complex numbers, to the reflected waves, which are B's. And uh, the scattering parameters themselves, so the elements of the matrix are reflection and transmission coefficients. So you can interpret them physically. Uh, the other thing that's good is that a lossless network is represented as a unitary matrix. So that's nice. Symmetry is also represented uh, nicely with matrix operations. The bad thing, and this is important, is that the matrix product is not useful. And that's a big problem. So they developed transfer parameters just by moving some of the A's and B's around the independent variables. And then you can relate this new matrix to the old scattering matrix as such. And the good thing about this matrix is that the uh, active cascading networks is implemented now with the matrix product. So if you have a lot of networks in series, you can just multiply their transfer parameters together to get the net result. So that's, that's really important. The other thing which is really nice is that reciprocity is now uh, represented with the unitary matrix and reciprocity is a physical law. And that encapsulates a lot more uh, devices than just losslessness. So that's essential. Uh, the bad is that the elements now of this matrix are not interpretable. And the bad thing about this and the scattering representation are that they're matrices, right? And so we all know those have problems. And so we want to solve this problem with geometric algebra. So just to recap, what am I doing? Okay, we have some reality, which are these microwave two port circuits. We have some existing model, which is a linear algebra based approach. And we're trying to translate that into geometric algebra so that we can gain some insight and maybe, you know, be able to solve some problems in a different way. So this is just a one slide uh, description of how we did this, but obviously the paper will give more detail. How we did it is really not that important. The interpretations of the resulting spinners are what really the paper focuses on. But in either case, so if we have some two port network S here, it's terminated at port two with some load that generates a reflection coefficient gamma two, okay? Then if we can express gamma one in terms of gamma two, parameterized by the elements of the scattering matrix, we get what's called the reflectometry equation. And there's a lot of ways you can derive this. This is kind of a basic uh, result of physics or electrical engineering. So once we have this, uh, we can see, well, hey, this is a conformal transformation. So I can rewrite it as such. And each one of these elements of the scattering matrix parameterizes this conformal transformation. So I have a translation, a dilation rotation, and a transversion. Now, once you have that, okay, you can go into conformal geometric algebra, represent this as spinners, and everything's good. What's really interesting is that the conformal geometric algebra for this space is the same as space-time algebra, so you get one-to-one, -one, you know, analogs, which I think is really, uh, could be really useful. Some results, okay, so we did that. What, what can we do with this? So one application that I looked at was interpolation, so we have some device here. 
we're going to measure or simulate that device to get a list of scattering matrices, right? Generally over frequency. Now, the current approach is that we're going to take one element of that matrix, project it down into the real and imaginary components, so all the S11s, all the real and imaginary components, and interpret those scalarly. Okay, big problem that doesn't preserve unitarity. You can imagine it's going to introduce all kinds of artifacts. So maybe we should interpolate the spinner like they do with the motors and the kinematics and things. So that's what we tried. So how are we going to evaluate this? We have a circuit. We're going to simulate this circuit, we're going to have a list of matrices that are true. We're then going to downsample it and then interpolate it and compare the interpolated result with the true result. So everything's done on a computer. The device uh, under test in this case is just a slab of glass with some air padding on each side. So it's a pretty simple network, but it gives you some nice mismatch and resonant behavior. And it's actually a useful test case for material characterization, which is a problem of interest at high frequencies. So here are some results. This is the reflection coefficient uh, shown in log scale from one to 10 gigahertz. And you can see here in the blue, the blue line is showing the true result. The black dots are showing the sampled result, which is very sparsely sampled. And then the red and the orange dashed lines show the Cartesian, which is kind of default interpolation. And the orange line is the uh, orange dashed line is the spinner version. Now you can see here the spinner version is uh, obviously much better. Here's the same result uh, looking at a projection of the transmission coefficient in log uh, mag scale, kind of similar results. So these look kind of amazing. If we look at it in a little bit of a larger dimensional space, we look at the complex reflection coefficient on the left and the complex transmission coefficient on the right, we kind of get a feel more for what's going on. And the background lines, don't worry about those, those are, that's called the Smith chart. That's like a microwave engineering thing. But in either case, it's less miraculous, but it's still amazing. Like how are the, how is this interpolated result able to infer these curves, right? Well, you know, I think the answer is that it's this network, this piece of glass is a really simple structure. The spinner is very simple. And the fact that we're representing it in the matrix we're really obfuscating the truth. And that's why taking all these little projections and interpolating them is giving us horrible results. So what you want to know is how is this going to do on average and how fast is it going to converge compared to existing results? So here's a plot of the interpolation error on the y-axis and log scale versus sampling rate on the x-axis from zero to 25%. And this just illustrates that the new method converges rapidly compared to both uh, a couple of the old ones. The Cartesian is the one I explained, the rational I didn't explain, but anyway, it's much better. The results are much better. Okay, so that's it. That's basically uh, all I'm going to talk about. So just in conclusion, I just want to give you like an example, uh, an idea of where this fits in with everything that exists already. So a model, the context for this model. So let's say we're starting from space time as the best model we have. So electrical engineers immediately go to time harmonic Maxwell equations. That's where we start, okay? Then to do microwave engineering, we're gonna start by further confining space in the transverse dimension. So it's a partial space harmonic solution, and that leads us to transmission lines. So we've confined space in both, you know, in the temporal dimension and in the space, two spatial dimensions. And then that leads us to network theory. It then gets more complicated because we've you know, reduced this problem a lot, and then we add a lot of different ports to our network, so it gets more complicated. But in either case, all of these different you know, sub-disciplines are taught using different structures, vector calculus, Mobius transformations, linear algebra. And so what we did in this paper is show that we can represent some portions of network theory using spinners. We also showed you could do the same thing with transmission line theory. But what's really amazing to me is that this allows the electrical engineers to talk to the quantum guys because the spinner mechanisms are all the same. So you can have a one-to-one -one analog. So what we'd really like to do, obviously, is go straight from space-time algebra all the way across the board and just stop in at all these little disciplines and be able to you know, explain how they all relate to each other. So that's kind of the overall goal. We've done a small portion of it. And uh, that's all I have today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much, Alex. Okay, let's move on to the next, pres the next presenter.